Okay, let's get started again. Today we're going to look at the fourth part of Standage's book, which is, of course, six glasses that have changed world history and the history of the world in six glasses. So today we'll start with uh, coffee. two parts to finish off the book well there's the third part with the epilogue but the next two parts tea and coke so this is like the big halfway point I would say another way to look at this is to think about it as this is like you've ended semester one so again I'll kind of review these slides for you here and let you think about this a little bit do you need to be reading the book yeah, I think you probably should read the book. The first quiz is Friday, August 30th, and there's a little prep, pep rally that day for the first football game. We'll have about 30 minutes of class, and we will definitely do the quiz first thing on Friday morning. The test over the book is going to be Wednesday and Thursday, which will be the, the following week. There's my email address right there. Get together with some friends. This is a good time to do it. Flight school's been this week, and students have had a chance to come up to the school and get their schedule and maybe their locker and, and those types of things. Find out where their classes are going to be. Find a friend. Did you read the book? Um, sit down with them and, and see what they think about it. So let's look next here at our timeline again. And as we go down through history, you see beers in that first period, then wine and spirits. We've covered those three alcoholic drinks. Now today we start to get to talk about caffeine a little bit. So we'll pump things up here a little bit. And I even have a little bit of coffee uh, for you. Not much left off the refill here in a bit. But uh, the first one here is coffee. And you'll see it's in that time period somewhere around, you know, 600 to 1450 uh, they start to understand that this coffee thing has merit. They start to understand how to make it. It starts mostly in the Islamic world. But when it makes a big global impact, you're going to see that in the 1450 to 1750 time period. Good way to think about that. And just, just after that as well, but good good way to think about that is the American Revolution that you should probably be familiar with since you have U.S. history like every single freaking year, it seems like, except this one. Uh, and we won't talk much American history, but you do you do know some dates. Hopefully, you know 1776 was the date of the Declaration of Independence, and coffee was a factor um, in that, and tea then as well. So, um, the last drink we'll look at is Coca-Cola, which has more of a global impact. We talk about the new global economy. Coca-Cola is an example of that. All right, so let's look here first at what we call coffee in the age of reason the drink of reason and revolution so the fun story about this who knows if this is true or just legend or a tale that's been passed along but this is the happy coincidence of how things happen in history um, goats will eat anything is <laughs> what this says and the grazing uh, goat that chomped on some cherry uh, cherry red berries that contained these beans inside these coffee beans that's what gave rise to the idea that hey maybe there's something in this um, that might be worth making a drink out of or eating and they call it the primitive power bar and this happened in the Islamic world so we're talking about this area here in the Middle East northern Africa is where this occurred and so you know, the coffee belt today is this area here at the bottom of the screen. That's where coffee is produced. Produced really in only one state in America. So if you can figure out what that is, a little bonus activity there. See so if you can think about what state in America would produce coffee. And you see the continental United States there. Uh, that might be a hint to you. So think about these questions as you roll through this. There's a bigger version of the coffee belt brought to you by the German Coffee Association of Hamburg. 
don't know about it here. Uh, the picture on the side there has a quote from Pope Clement the Seventh, the Eighth. Sorry, Pope Clement, wherever you may be. Um, why this Satan's drink is so delicious that it would be a pity to let the infidels have exclusive use of it. Infidels, non-believers, or in their mind, Muslims at that time. Um, we shall cheat Satan by baptizing it. Now, is this true? Did Clement really say this in around around 1600? Hard to tell and hard hard to pin this one down. I don't think it's been written down anywhere. But it's been attributed to him. And you can imagine that almost happening where they bring coffee to the Pope to say, Okay, Pope, what's the deal here? Is this going to be something that we can have? Because it seems to have some good qualities in the Arab world. You already know this, because we had discussed it earlier, had had a tough time with the alcoholic drinks. Muhammad said, no alcohol, so will he be okay with coffee, with tea, with carbonate, or with carbonate, with uh, caffeinated beverages? Um, and that's, that's one of the things to keep in mind here. So sometime around the 15th century, it starts to spread throughout the Arab world, coffee does. And Standage's quote here from the book is, In the Arab world, coffee arose as an alternative to alcohol. Coffee houses as an alternative to taverns. In many ways, you can think about it this way. The Islamic world experiences this growth and intellectual boom, smartness and an age of reason, a scientific revolution before Europe does. And those ideas kind of spread to Europe. We talked about that in the last uh, video presentation. Do you think coffee might have had something to do with that? I think it does. Also, that coffee house mentality where people are getting together and sharing their ideas. Just at the point where the Enlightenment's getting going, that's in, in Europe. Here's a drink that sharpens the mind. That's according to Stanage. This ability to sit and discuss uh, advances in thought and uh, intellectual exchanges that happen between math and science in, in different areas, even in political science and political thought. Uh, coffee helped to fuel that, and tea as well, but the Lloyds of London and London Stock Exchanges both were originally coffee houses, and they kind of exploded out of that. Coffee is sort of like the driver of the first internet, in a way. This first way to share information with a group of people, and so you see there the painting at the bottom. I really like that quite a lot. You've got a person who looks to be uh, an Islamic Turk who's holding um, a saucer with some coffee in it. And you see some, some people there. They, these are obviously Europeans who are drinking it. These This idea of coffee being traded to Europeans and them uh, capitalizing on it and enjoying it, it, it definitely explodes there. The coffee house functioned as information exchanges. We'll learn about this during the scientific uh, revolution and the Enlightenment as something called the age of the philosoph or philosophers, people who shared their breakthroughs. And really, what was amazing was one field would influence another. You might have someone like John Locke who believed that uh, all people were uh, essentially created equal and born equal, born with a blank slate. Those ideas in political thought maybe could be proven through scientific advances as well. And so we'll, we'll talk more about that later. It's real interesting to see how it brewed up some controversy here. It's a newer and safer alternative to alcoholic drinks and, and to water, which often was difficult to drink because of disease. And um, so it's a safe drink because you're boiling it and, and getting the water very hot. Some argued that it promoted rational uh, inquiry, and that should be an I for inquiry, I believe, and had m medicinal qualities. So you could use coffee to, you know, get rid of a headache or um, maybe, maybe feel better. You have a stomach ache, you drink some coffee, it might make you feel better. There's some truth to some of that. Coffee can act as a laxative, which could make you, you know, go to the bathroom when you're having trouble doing that. It can also uh, opens up the blood vessels a bit with the caffeine and can help a headache. So there's some truth to that. But women felt quite threatened by it, arguing that due to its supposed uh, effect on the male potency, 
the whole race was in danger of extinction. And part of this is because men were going off to coffee houses, spending time there, not spending time with their wives. Uh, coffee houses were places where mostly men were getting together to discuss ideas. You'll see it changes a little bit in France uh, in comparison. But governments tried to suppress these places. They tried to uh, tamp them down because they didn't want their citizens, or they weren't even citizens then, their subjects of their kingdom to be discussing politics and thinking about ways that they could organize as a people against the king or the church. So the coffee house internet, the drink of reason, whole empires were built on coffee. And here's some examples of this exchange network and how it can impact history. The Arabs had monopoly on beans. Obviously, you see where the coffee belt is there. That's uh, an area where the Middle East um, and the Islamic world continues across northern Africa. They have a connection there. The Arab trading centers that moved throughout Southeast Asia, they controlled places where you could, could get um, and make coffee, but also it had to be traded through that middleman of the, the Arab state, the Islamic state. The Dutch were middle persons in that as well because they would trade um, the coffee to the Arabs in many cases, but they are uh, setting up these plantations in a place called Java, one of those places, so that's kind of where the, the they, they get the nickname for coffee. French began uh, plantations in the West Indies and in Haiti, which we'll see later on has a big impact on history when we talk about the Haitian Revolution and that connection to the French Revolution. But through a study of coffee and coffee houses, students learned about all kinds of different subjects. They called these the penny universities because for about a penny or two, you get a little dish of coffee and sit in the, anybody could walk in off the street and sit and you might be conversing and talking with some of the leading thinkers of the day. People like Isaac Newton, who Standage claims uh, came through uh, some of his breakthroughs by sitting in a coffee house conversing with other people and, and getting their ideas from them, the sharing of information. Uh, this is a real good uh, cl clip, a little video clip. I'm going to insert this into the video here. But this uh, man, Stephen Johnson, is going to assert that coffee in the age of the Enlightenment made a real big impact during this time period. So I'll put this in here and you'll see this clip and then we'll, we'll come right back and look at the notes. So Priestley had this problem where he couldn't get access to, he didn't have the information networks that he needed. And so he got an introduction um, to Benjamin Franklin and goes to London and meets Franklin in a coffee house, the London coffee house, um, and pitches him on this idea for this, this book about electricity that he wants to write. Now, the coffee house culture is crucial to this story as well. Um, in, on, on two levels. First, the information networks of the day. The coffee house was a great hub of Enlightenment era culture. People would come into the coffee house, they would hang out, they would share ideas, they would come from different disciplines. A whole number of crucial events in the history of Enlightenment culture have a coffee house somewhere in them one way or another. The whole insurance business is invented in Lloyd's Coffee House, which becomes Lloyd's of London. Um, and so Franklin had this group called the Club of Honest Whigs that would get together, and they would hang out, and they would talk about electricity, and they would talk about chemistry, and they would talk about politics, and they would talk about religion. And it was really this crucial kind of hub in, this, in this, the information networks of the time. The other important part about the coffee house was the coffee, right? Because until coffee and tea became kind of mainstream beverages in the 18th century, the daytime beverage of choice for, the, for the, both the mass and elites in, in British society was alcohol for health reasons, right? Because you would, the water just wasn't safe to drink. And so you had an entire culture that was waking up in the morning and drinking two pints of beer and then you know, going to work and then having a little bit more beer and then having a little wine and then having a little gin, particularly in the 1600s, and then having a little bit more wine, a little bit more beer. So the entire culture basically was drunk all day long <laughs> as a kind of default state, right? And so it's not an accident. I mean, it sounds like a joke. It sounds like something you drink, somebody who drinks a lot of coffee would say. But it's not an accident that the age of re reason accompanies the rise of caffeinated beverages. Because think about what your life would be like if you switch from drinking two pints of beer in the morning to drinking two cups of coffee. I know some of you do drink two pints of beer in the morning. And I, and I think I know which one's there. Um, so you're going to have, you're going to be sharper, you're going to be more productive. The culture is moving from a depressant to a stimulant, and the, there's going to be results kind of rippling through the culture in that way. So, so the coffee house is part of the story of why was Priestley able to do what he did at that point. 
So interesting clip, and we'll probably see that in class as well and have a little discussion on it. Let's talk about revolution. So the age of enlightenment and this, these ideas that were being shared, well, some of these ideas, they looked at the reality of the world around them, especially in France, where you've got this makeup of the world in these three estates. And we'll study this in great depth when we get to the uh, French Revolution, which is always one of the top two or three things that students enjoy from the class throughout the year. The French Revolution will blow your mind. Um, you see, the first estate is the clergy or the church. They hold about 98, I'm sorry, about 1.5, uh, so I got it wrong again, it's 0.5% of the population, it's a little black spot there, That's you see the black area here. So 98% is the population that is of the third estate, the common people, and a common, commoners is probably a bad term, it's everyone other than the church and the nobility, which is the king and his court. So population, you've got these three estates, and they act as voting blocks, each one with one vote. Land ownership, hugely weighted towards uh, the commoners. They had most of the land, uh, but the clergy and the nobility, only 35% of the land, they had complete control over taxation. And you see the only people paying taxes is the third estate or the commoners or really everyone other than the king and the queen and the court and the church, the Catholic church, the only church at the time. The little political cartoon below this has the king and then the church is uh, you know, represented by this person. And here is a French citizen who is tearing away the chains that held him down and there are the guns surrounding him as he rises up they are shocked oh my goodness here comes this man who's who's going to try to change things and these are the Fran the very famous and maybe maybe my my favorite part of the French Revolution are the fearsome fish women who rise up out of the really the gutters of society their job is to to cut fish and to Put them into boxes and cart those boxes these are women with big muscles and they had some strength and were common people that they rose up and stormed the castle to get after the queen the bottom picture there is a pretty famous painting by uh, david we'll see a good video on him later in the year and this is called the tennis court oath where the french people are avowing to meet and the representatives of the people vowing to meet and stay until they develop a constitution. This is essentially the French Revolution in four little snapshot pictures here. So how did coffee houses uh, factor into this? The surveillance state of France meant that the common people were not allowed to just speak their mind against the king or against the church. These first two estates would work together, vote together, and eliminate whatever the common person uh, would want to do. If you wanted to pass a law, there's no way you could really do it. And really, the three estates didn't even meet as a governmental body for hundreds of years because the king said, we don't want them to meet. But um, there's another little typo here. It says to arms, citizens to arms. Uh, so that should be arms. But this is a young lawyer who, whose cries sparked the bloody and crazed revolution in France. And what they do is rise up against the king and overthrow him and in essence they also overthrow the church the other very powerful part of france it gets a lot messier after that but coffee has a factor in here because coffee houses were where they got together and discussed these political uh, changes and then put them into motion they were the first meeting places of the revolution and women had a larger role in the coffee house in France than they did in uh, in in Britain in um, in London. So let's flip back down here and take a look at the next part, which you'll see on the left shows you liberty, equality, fraternity, the three ideals of the French Revolution, and their tricolor, the three uh, colors of the flag: blue, white, and red. Um, a little. Uh, graphic there that shows you all the different ways today you can have coffee. If you want um, a latte macchiato, it's espresso and steamed milk. 
uh, coffee and a little espresso is called the red eye. So it gives you some ideas of what they do with coffee today. Um, and here's a fun slide for you. But the one part of this I really wanted to focus on was that highest coffee production areas. Look at Brazil, 38% of the coffee production value in the world is in Brazil. It's really the home of, of coffee creation. But there are countries all across the map, mostly in that coffee belt. You can see how big they are. Look at Europe. There's just absolutely no coffee created in Europe. You can see just the li tiny little lines. Yet Europeans are the ones that are getting it shipped to them in, in massive quantities. Of course, if you flipped back here and looked at these different drinks, most of them also are going to have some kind of sugar in it and sugar is also going to play a factor here with this because what do you need to get sugar created how do you make sugar at this time sugar cane plantations and slavery of course is going to be a, a, a big problem uh, for especially Africans who were brought over and Native Americans indigenous people in America who were forced to work on these um, sugarcane plantations. Probably the most difficult work, some of the most difficult work ever done on the planet. Think about those six questions. Do you understand them enough to answer them um, to do well in that first week when we get back together? That's something you need to be thinking about. The next time we meet with another video clip, we'll talk about the empires of tea and not just Mr. T and Ice Cube and um, other various interesting people there, uh, but we'll get into the empires of tea. We'll look at China and their dynasties and also the massive and most powerful, really one of the most superpower, most massive superpowers in world's history, which is uh, the British and the colonization and imperialization of the globe. We'll see you next time. Thanks for being here, and don't forget to be